brought to you by bunnyslippers.com. Check out their brand new Dino Sound Slippers. Slippers make a roaring sound every three steps. Made with green scaly fabric, soft plush uppers, foam footbeds, non-slip grips on soles, and three white claws on each foot. One size fits most up to women's ten and a half, men's nine. Footbed measures ten and a half. Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story, either a chapter of a novel or a whole short story. Join us in our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, gothic horror, weird fiction, and cosmic horror. And don't forget to join us for our monthly show about the Cthulhu Mythos. Look for our podcast near the old wishing well in the Blasted Heath, wherever you find your podcast. We suggest Podbean or Apple Podcasts. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube. Welcome to Black Clock Audio Tales. Check out our new website over at www.pgttcm.com. Edited by Daniel Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. The Chamber, A Price of Gloom, Despair. Welcome to Part 1, Folklore of Great Britain. Join us at the end of the month when we talk about the Great Old Ones. Whippity Story I am going to tell you a story about a poor young widow woman who lived in a house called Kittle Rumpet. The whereabouts in Scotland the house of Kittle Rumpet stood, nobody knows. Some folk think that it stood in the neighborhood of the debatable land, which, as all the world knows, was on the borders, where the old border reavers were constantly coming and going, the Scotch stealing from the English and the English from the Scotch. Be that as it may, the widowed mistress of Kittle Rumpet was sorely to be pitied, for she had lost her husband and no one quite knew what had become of him. He had gone to a fair one day and had never come back again, and although everybody believed that he was dead, no one knew how he died. Some people said that he had been persuaded to enlist and had been killed in the wars. Others that he had been taken away to serve as a sailor by the press gang and had been drowned at sea. At any rate, his poor young wife was sorely to be pitied, for she was left with a little baby boy to bring up, and as times were bad, she had not much to live on. But she loved her baby dearly and worked all day amongst her cows and pigs and hens in order to earn enough money to buy food and clothes for both herself and him. Now on the morning of which I am speaking, she rose very early and went out to feed her pigs. For rent day was coming on, and she intended to take one of them, a great big fat creature, to the market that very day, as she thought that the price that it would fetch would go a long way towards paying her rent. And because she thought so, her heart was light, and she hummed a little song to herself as she crossed the yard, with her bucket on one arm and her baby boy on the other. But the song was quickly changed into a cry of despair when she reached the pigsty, for there lay her cherished pig on its back, with its legs in the air and its eyes shut, just as if it were going to breathe its last breath. "'What shall I do? What shall I do?' cried the poor woman, sitting down on a big stone and clasping her boy to her breast, heedless of the fact that she had dropped her bucket, and that the pig's meat was running out, and that the hens were eating it. First I lost my husband, and now I am going to lose my finest pig, the pig that I hoped would fetch a deal o' money. Now I must explain to you that the house of Kittle Rumpet stood on a hillside, with a great fir wood behind it, and the ground sloping down steeply in front. And as the poor young thing, after having a good cry to herself, was drying her eyes, she chanced to look down the hill, and who should she see coming up it but an old woman, who looked like a lady born. She was dressed all in green with a white apron, and she wore a black velvet hood on her head, and a steeple-crowned beaver hat over that, something like those, as I have heard tell, that the women wear in Wales. She walked very slowly, leaning on a long staff, and she gave a bit hurple now and then as if she were lame. As she drew near, the young widow felt it was becoming to rise and curtsy to the gentlewoman, for such she saw her to be. Madam, she said with a sob in her voice, I bid you welcome to the house of Kittle Rumpet, 
although you find its mistress one of the most unfortunate women in the world. Hoot, hoot, answered the old lady, in such a harsh voice that the young woman started and grasped her baby tighter in her arms. You have little need to say that. You have lost your husband, I grant ye, but there were losses at Shira Muir, and now your pig is like to die. I could maybe remedy that, but I must first hear how much you would gave me if I cured him. Anything that your ladyship's madam likes to ask, replied the widow, too much delighted at having the animal's life saved, to think that she was making rather a rash promise. Very good, said the old dame, and without wasting any more words, she walked straight into the pigsty. She stood and looked at the dying creature for some minutes, rocking to and fro and muttering to herself in words which the widow could not understand. At least she could only understand four of them and they sounded something like this, pitter-patter, halley-water. Then she put her hand into her pocket and drew out a tiny bottle with a liquid that looked like oil in it. She took the cork out and dropped one of her long, ladylike fingers into it. Then she touched the pig on the snout and on his ears and on the tip of his curly tail. No sooner had she done so than up the beast jumped and with a grunt of contentment ran off to its trough to look for its breakfast. A joyful woman was the mistress of Kittle Rumpet when she saw it do this, for she felt that her rent was safe, and in her relief and gratitude she would have kissed the hem of the strange lady's green gown, if she would have allowed it, but she would not. No, no, said she, and her voice sounded harsher than ever. Let us have no fine meanderings, but let us stick to our bargain. I have done my part and mended the pig. Now you must do yours and give me what I like to ask, your son. Then the poor widow gave a piteous cry, for she knew now what she had not guessed before, that the green-clad lady was a fairy, and a wicked fairy too, else had she not asked such a terrible thing. It was too late now, however, to pray and beseech and beg for mercy. The fairy stood her ground hard and cruel. You promised me what I like to ask, and I have asked your son, and your son I will have, she replied. So it is useless making such a din about it. But one thing I may tell you, for I know well that the knowledge will not help you. By the laws of fairyland, I cannot take the baron to the third day after this. And if by that time you have found out my name, I cannot take him, even then, that you will not be able to find it out. Of that I am certain, so I will call back for the boy in three days. And with that she disappeared round the back of the pigsty, and the poor mother fell down in a dead faint beside the stone. All that day and all the next she did nothing but sit in her kitchen and cry, and hug her baby tighter in her arms. But on the day before that on which the fairy said that she was coming back, she felt as if she must get a little breath of fresh air so she went for a walk in the fir wood behind the house. Now in this fir wood there was an old quarry hole, in the bottom of which was a bonny spring well, the water of which was always sweet and pure. The young widow was walking near this quarry hole when, to her astonishment, she heard the whirr of a spinning wheel and the sound of a voice lilting a song. At first she could not think where the sound came from. Then, remembering the quarry, she laid down her child at a tree root and crept noiselessly through the bushes on her hands and knees to the edge of the hole and peeped over. She could hardly believe her eyes, for there, far below her, at the bottom of the quarry, beside the spring well, sat the cruel fairy, dressed in her green frock and tall felt hat, spinning away as fast as she could at a tiny spinning wheel. And what should she be singing but... Little kens are good dame at hame, whippity story is my name. The widow woman almost cried aloud for joy, for now she had learned the fairy's secret, and her child was safe, but she dare not in case the wicked old dame heard her and threw some other spell over her. So she crept softly back to the place where she had left her child. Then, catching him up in her arms, she ran through the wood to her house, laughing and singing, and tossing him in the air, in such a state of delight that if anyone had met her they would have been in danger of thinking that she was mad. 
Now this young woman had been a merry-hearted maiden, and would have been merry-hearted still, if since her marriage she had not had so much trouble that it had made her grow old and sober-minded before her time. And she began to think what fun it would be to tease the fairy for a few minutes, before she let her know that she had found out her name. So next day, at the appointed time, she went out with her boy in her arms and seated herself on the big stone where she had sat before, and when she saw the old dame coming up the hill, she crumpled up her nice clean cap and screwed up her face and pretended to be in great distress and to be crying bitterly. The fairy took no notice of this, however, but came close up to her and said in her harsh, merciless voice, "'Good wife of Kittle Rumpet, ye ken the reason of my coming. Give me the bairn." Then the young mother pretended to be in sorer distress than ever, and fell on her knees before the wicked old woman, and begged for mercy. "'Oh, sweet madam mistress,' she cried, "'spare me my bairn and take, and thou wilt the pig instead.' "'We have no need of bacon where I come from,' answered the fairy coldly. "'So give me the laddie and let me be gone. "'I have no time to waste in this wise.' "'Oh, dear lady mine,' pleaded the good wife, "'if thou wilt not have the pig, "'wilt thou not spare my poor bairn and take me myself?' "'The fairy stepped back a little as if in astonishment. "'Art thou mad, woman?' she cried contemptuously. "'That thou proposest such a thing.' Who in all the world would care to take a plain-looking, red-eyed, dowdy wife like thee with them? Now the young mistress of Kittle Rumpet knew that she was no beauty, and the knowledge had never vexed her, but something in the fairy's tone made her feel so angry that she could contain herself no longer. In troth, fair madam, I might have had the wit to know that the like of me is not fit to tie the shoestring of the high and mighty princess whippity story if there had been a charge of gunpowder buried in the ground and if it had suddenly exploded beneath her feet the wicked fairy could not have jumped higher into air and when she came down again she simply turned round and ran down the brae shrieking with rage and disappointment for all the world as an old book says like an owl chased by witches Recording by Nan Dodge The Red Eaton There were once two widows who lived in two cottages which stood not very far from one another, and each of these two widows possessed a piece of land on which she grazed a cow and a few sheep, and in this way she made her living. One of these poor widows had two sons, the other had one, and as these three boys were always together, it was natural that they should become great friends. At last the time arrived when the eldest son of the widow who had two sons must leave home and go out into the world to seek his fortune. And the night before he went away, his mother told him to take a can and go to the well and bring back some water, and she would bake a cake for him to carry with him. But remember, she added, the size of the cake will depend on the quantity of water that thou bringest back. If thou bringest much, then will it be large, and if thou bringest little, then will it be small. But big or little, it is still all that I have to give thee. The lad took the can and went off to the well and filled it with water and came home again. But he never noticed that the can had a hole in it and was running out, so that by the time that he arrived at home there was very little water left, so his mother could only bake him a very little cake. But small as it was, she asked him, as she gave it to him, to choose one of two things, either to take half of it with her blessing, or the whole of it with her malison. For, said she, thou canst not have both the whole cake and the blessing along with it. The lad looked at the cake and hesitated. It would have been pleasant to have left home with his mother's blessing upon him, but he had far to go, and the cake was little. The half of it would be a mere mouthful and he did not know when he would get any more food. So at last he made up his mind to take the whole of it, even if he had to bear his mother's malison. Then he took his younger brother aside and gave him his hunting knife, saying, Keep this by thee and look at it every morning, for as long as the blade remains clear and bright, thou wilt know that it is well with me. 
but should it grow dim and rusty, then know thou that some evil hath befallen me. After this he embraced them both and set out on his travels. He journeyed all that day and all the next, and on the afternoon of the third day he came to where an old shepherd was sitting beside a flock of sheep. I will ask the old man whose sheep they are, he said to himself, for mayhap his master might engage me also as a shepherd. So he went up to the old man and asked him to whom the sheep belonged, and this was all the answer he got. The Red Eton of Ireland, aunts lived in Ballygan, and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the king of fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he dings her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man. It's said there's ain predestinate to be his mortal foe, but that man is yet unborn, and lang may it be so. That does not tell me much, but somehow I do not fancy this red Eton for a master, thought the youth, and he went on his way. He had not gone very far, however, when he saw another old man with snow-white hair herding a flock of swine, and as he wondered to whom the swine belonged, and if there was any chance of him getting a situation as a swineherd, he went up to the countryman and asked who was the owner of the animals. He got the same answer from the swineherd that he had got from the shepherd. The Red Eton of Ireland, aunts lived in Ballygan and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the king of fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he dings her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man. It's said there's ain predestinate to be his mortal foe, but that man is yet unborn, and lang may it be so. Plague on this old red Eton, I wonder when I will get out of his domains, he muttered to himself, and he journeyed still further. Presently he came to a very, very old man, so old indeed that he was quite bent with age, and he was herding a flock of goats. Once more the traveller asked to whom the animals belonged, and once more he got the same answer. The Red Eton of Ireland once lived in Ballygan and stole King Malcolm's daughter, the King of Fair Scotland. He beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he dings her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man. It's said there's ain predestinate to be his mortal foe, but that man is yet unborn, and lang may it be so. But this ancient goatherd added a piece of advice at the end of his rhyme. Beware, stranger, he said, of the next herd of beasts that ye shall meet. Sheep and swine and goats will harm nobody, but the creatures ye shall now encounter are of a sort that ye have never met before, and they are not harmless. The young man thanked him for his counsel and went on his way, and he had not gone very far before he met a herd of very dreadful creatures, unlike anything that he had ever dreamed of in all his life. For each of them had three heads, and on each of these three heads it had four horns, and when he saw them he was so frightened that he turned and ran away from them as fast as he could. Up hill and down dale he ran until he was well nigh exhausted, and just when he was beginning to feel that his legs would not carry him any further, he saw a great castle in front of him, the door of which was standing wide open. He was so tired that he went straight in, and after wandering through some magnificent halls, which appeared to be quite deserted, he reached the kitchen, where an old woman was sitting by the fire. He asked her if he might have a night's lodging, as he had come a long and weary journey and would be glad of somewhere to rest. "'Ye can rest here and welcome for me,' said the old dame, "'but for your own sake I warn you that this is an ill house to bide in, for it is the castle of the Red Eton, who is a fierce and terrible monster with three heads, and he spareth neither man nor woman if he can get hold of them. Tired as he was, the young man would have made an effort to escape from such a dangerous abode had he not remembered the strange and awful beasts from which he had just been fleeing, and he was afraid that as it was growing dark 
If he set out again, he might chance to walk right into their midst. So he begged the old woman to hide him in some dark corner, and not to tell the red Eton that he was in the castle. For, thought he, if I can only get shelter until the morning, I will then be able to avoid these terrible creatures and go on my way in peace. So the old dame hid him in a press under the back stairs, and, as there was plenty of room in it, he settled down quite comfortably for the night. But just as he was going off to sleep, he heard an awful roaring and trampling overhead. The red Eton had come home, and it was plain that he was searching for something. And the terrified youth soon found out what the something was, for very soon the horrible monster came into the kitchen, crying out in a voice like thunder, Seek but and seek Ben, I smell the smell of an earthly man. Be he living or be he dead, his heart this night I shall eat with my bread. And it was not very long before he discovered the poor young man's hiding place and pulled him roughly out of it. Of course the lad begged that his life might be spared, but the monster only laughed at him. It will be spared if thou canst answer three questions, he said. If not, it is forfeited. The first of these three questions was whether Ireland or Scotland was first inhabited. The second, how old was the world when Adam was made? And the third, whether men or beasts were created first? The lad was not skilled in such matters, having had but little book learning, and he could not answer the questions. So the monster struck him on the head with a queer little hammer which he carried and turned him into a piece of stone. Now every morning since he had left home, his younger brother had done as he had promised, and had carefully examined his hunting knife. On the first two mornings it was bright and clear, but on the third morning he was very much distressed to find that it was dull and rusty. He looked at it for a few moments in great dismay, then he ran straight to his mother and held it out to her. By this token I know that some mischief hath befallen my brother, he said, so I must set out at once to see what evil hath come upon him. First thou must go to the well and fetch me some water, said his mother, that I may bake thee a cake to carry with thee as I baked a cake for him who is gone, and I will say to thee what I said to him, that the cake will be large or small, according as thou bringest much or little water back with thee. So the lad took the can, as his brother had done, and went off to the well, and it seemed as if some evil spirit directed him to follow his example in all things, for he brought home little water, and he chose the whole cake and his mother's malison instead of the half and her blessing, and he set out and met the shepherd and the swineherd and the goatherd, and they all gave the same answers to him which they had given to his brother, and he also encountered the same fierce beasts, and ran from them in terror, and took shelter from them in the castle, and the old woman hid him, and the red Eton found him, and, because he could not answer the three questions, he, too, was turned into a pillar of stone. And no more would ever have been heard of these two youths, had not a kind fairy, who had seen all that had happened, appeared to the other widow and her son, as they were sitting at supper one night in the gloaming, and told them the whole story, and how their two poor young neighbors had been turned into pillars of stone by a cruel enchanter called Red Eaton. Now the third young man was both brave and strong, and he determined to set out to see if he could in any wise help his two friends. And from the very first moment that he had made up his mind to do so, things went differently with him than they had with them. I think, perhaps, that this was because he was much more loving and thoughtful than they were. For when his mother sent him to fetch water from the well so that she might bake a cake for him, just as the other mother had done for her sons, a raven flying above his head croaked out that his can was leaking, and he, wishing to please his mother by bringing her a good supply of water, patched up the hole with clay, and so came home with the can quite full. Then, when his mother had baked a big bannock for him, and giving him the choice between the whole cake with her malison, or half of it and her blessing, he chose the latter. For, said he, throwing his arms round her neck, 
I may light on other cakes to eat, but I will never light on another blessing such as thine. And the curious thing was, after he had said this, the half-cake which he had chosen seemed to spread itself out and widen and broaden, till it was bigger by far than it had been at first. Then he started on his journey, and after he had gone a good way he began to feel hungry, so he pulled it out of his pocket and began to eat it. Just then he met an old woman who seemed to be very poor, for her clothing was thin and worn and old, and she stopped and spoke to him. Of thy charity, kind master, she said, stretching out one of her withered hands, spare me a bit of the cake that thou art eating. Now the youth was very hungry, and he could have eaten it all himself, but his kind heart was touched by the woman's pinched face, so he broke it in two and gave her half of it. Instantly she was changed into the fairy who had appeared to his mother and himself, as they had sat at supper the night before, and she smiled graciously at the generous lad, and held out a little wand to him. Though thou knowest it not, thy mother's blessing and thy kindness to an old and poor woman hath gained thee many blessings, brave boy, she said. Keep that as thy reward, thou wilt need it ere thy errand be done. Then bidding him sit down on the grass beside her, she told him all the dangers that he would meet on his travels, and the way in which he could overcome them, and then in a moment before he could thank her, she vanished out of his sight. But with the little wand and all the instructions that she had given him, he felt that he could face fearlessly any danger that he might be called on to meet. So he rose from the grass and went his way, full of a cheerful courage. After he had walked for many miles further, he came, as each of his friends had done, to the old shepherd herding his sheep, and, like them, he asked to whom the sheep belonged. And this time the old man answered, The Red Eaton of Ireland unslived in Balligan and stole King Malcolm's daughter. The king of fair Scotland, he beats her, he binds her, he lays her on a band, and every day he dings her with a bright silver wand. Like Julian the Roman, he's one that fears no man. But now I fear his end is near and destiny at hand, and you're to be a plainly see the heir of all his land. Then the young man went on, and he came to the swineherd and to the goatherd, and each of them in return repeated the same words to him. And when he came to where the droves of monstrous beasts were, he was not afraid of them. When one came running up to him with its mouth wide open to devour him, he just struck it with his wand, and it dropped down dead at his feet. At last he arrived at the Red Eton's castle, and he knocked boldly at the door. The old woman answered his knock, and when he had told her his errand warned him gravely not to enter. Thy two friends came here before thee, she said, and they are now turned into two pillars of stone. What advantage is it to thee to lose thy life also? But the young man only laughed. I have knowledge of an art, of which they know nothing, he said, and methinks I can fight the Red Eton with his own weapons. So much against her will, the old woman let him in and hid him where she had hid his friends. It was not long before the monster arrived, and as on former occasions he came into the kitchen in a furious rage, crying, Seek but and seek Ben, I smell the smell of an earthly man. Be he living or be he dead, his heart this night I shall eat with my bread. Then he peered into the young man's hiding place and called to him to come out. And after he had come out, he put to him the three questions, never dreaming that he could answer them. But the fairy had told the youth what to say, and he gave the answers as pat as any book. Then the Red Eaton's heart sank within him for fear, for he knew that someone had betrayed him, and that his power was gone. And gone in very truth it was, for when the youth took an axe and began to fight with him, he had no strength to resist and before he knew where he was, his heads were cut off, and that was the end of the Red Eton. As soon as he saw that his enemy was really dead, the young man asked the old woman if what the shepherd and the swineherd and the goatherd had told him were true, and if King Malcolm's daughter 
were really a prisoner in the castle. The old woman nodded. Even with the monster lying dead at my feet, I am almost afraid to speak of it, she said. But come with me, my gallant gentleman, and thou wilt see what duel and misery the red Eton hath cost to many a hame. She took a huge bunch of keys and led him up a long flight of stairs, which ended in a passage with a great many doors on each side of it. She unlocked these doors with her keys, and as she opened them she put her head into every room and said, "'Ye have naught to fear now, madam. The predestined deliverer hath come, and the red Eton is dead.' And behold, with a cry of joy, out of every room came a beautiful lady who had been stolen from her home and shut up there by the Red Eton. Among them was one who was more beautiful and stately than the rest, and all the others bowed down to her, and treated her with such great reverence that it was clear to see that she was the royal princess, King Malcolm's daughter. And when the youth stepped forward and did reverence to her also, she spoke so sweetly to him, and greeted him so gladly, and called him her deliverer, in such a low, clear voice that his heart was taken captive at once. But for all that he did not forget his friends. He asked the old woman where they were, and she took him into a room at the end of the passage, which was so dark that one could scarcely see in it, and so low that one could scarcely stand upright. In this dismal chamber stood two blocks of stone. One can unlock doors, young master said the old woman, shaking her head forebodingly, but tis hard work to try to turn cold stain back to flesh and blood. Nevertheless, I will do it, said the youth, and, lifting his little wand, he touched each of the stone pillars lightly on the top. Instantly the hard stone seemed to soften and melt away, and the two brothers started into life and form again. Their gratitude to their friend, who had risked so much to save them, knew no bounds, while he, on his part, was delighted to think that his efforts had been successful. The next thing to do was to convey the princess and the other ladies, who were all noblemen's daughters, back to the king's court, and this they did next day. King Malcolm was so overjoyed to see his dearly loved daughter, whom he had given up for dead, safe and sound, and so grateful to her deliverer that he said that he should become his son-in-law and marry the princess and come and live with them at court, which all came to pass in due time, while as for the other two young men, they married noblemen's daughters, and the two old mothers came to live near their the seal-catcher and the merman. Once upon a time there was a man who lived not very far from John O'Groat's house, which, as everyone knows, is in the very north of Scotland. He lived in a little cottage by the seashore, and made his living by catching seals and selling their fur, which is very valuable. He earned a good deal of money in this way, for these creatures used to come out of the sea in large numbers, and lie on the rocks near his house basking in the sunshine, so that it was not difficult to creep up behind them and kill them. Some of these seals were larger than others, and the country people used to call them Vron, and whisper that they were not seals at all, but mermen and merwomen, who came from a country of their own, far down under the ocean, who assumed this strange disguise in order that they might pass through the water and come up to breathe the air of this earth of ours. But the seal-catcher only laughed at them and said that those seals were most worth killing, for their skins were so big that he got an extra price for them. Now it chanced one day, when he was pursuing his calling, that he stabbed a seal with his hunting knife, and whether the stroke had not been sure enough or not I cannot say, but with a loud cry of pain the creature slipped off the rock into the sea, and disappeared under the water carrying the knife along with it. The seal-catcher, much annoyed at his clumsiness, and also at the loss of his knife, went home to dinner in a very downcast frame of mind. On his way he met a horseman, who was so tall and so strange-looking, and who rode on such a gigantic horse, that he stopped and looked at him in astonishment. 
wondering who he was and from what country he came. The stranger stopped also and asked him his trade, and on hearing that he was a seal catcher, he immediately ordered a great number of seal skins. The seal catcher was delighted, for such an order meant a large sum of money to him. But his face fell when the horseman added that it was absolutely necessary that the skin should be delivered that evening. "'I cannot do it,' he said in a disappointed voice, "'for the seals will not come back to the rocks again until tomorrow morning.' "'I can take you to a place where there are any number of seals,' answered the stranger, "'if you will mount behind me on my horse and come with me.' The seal-catcher agreed to this and climbed up behind the rider, who shook his bridle rein, and off the great horse galloped at such a pace that he had much ado to keep his seat. On and on they went, flying like the wind, until at last they came to the edge of a huge precipice, the face of which went sheer down to the sea. Here the mysterious horseman pulled up his steed with a jerk. "'Get off now,' he said shortly. The seal-catcher did as he was bid, and when he found himself safe on the ground, he peeped cautiously over the edge of the cliff to see if there were any seals lying on the rocks below. To his astonishment he saw no rocks, only the blue sea, which came right up to the foot of the cliff. "'Where are the seals that you spoke of?' he asked anxiously, wishing that he had never set out on such a rash adventure. "'Ye will see presently,' answered the stranger, who was attending to his horse's bridle. The seal-catcher was now thoroughly frightened, for he felt sure that some evil was about to befall him, and in such a lonely place he knew that it would be useless to cry out for help. And it seemed as if his fears would prove only too true, for the next moment the stranger's hand was laid upon his shoulder, and he felt himself being hurled bodily over the cliff, and then he fell with a splash into the sea. He thought that his last hour had come, and he wondered how anyone could work such a deed of wrong upon an innocent man. But, to his astonishment, he found that some change must have passed over him, for instead of being choked by the water, he could breathe quite easily, and he and his companion, who was still close at his side, seemed to be sinking as quickly down through the sea as they had flown through the air. Down and down they went, nobody knows how far, till at last they came to a huge arched door, which appeared to be made of pink coral, studded over with cockle shells. It opened of its own accord, and when they entered, they found themselves in a huge hall, the walls of which were formed of mother of pearl, and the floor of which was of sea sand, smooth and firm and yellow. The hall was crowded with occupants, but they were seals, not men, and when the seal-catcher turned to his companion to ask him what it all meant, he was aghast to find that he, too, had assumed the form of a seal. He was still more aghast when he caught sight of himself in a large mirror that hung on the wall, and saw that he also no longer bore the likeness of a man, but was transformed into a nice, hairy, brown seal. "'Ah, woe to me!' he said to himself. For no fault of mine own this artful stranger hath laid some baneful charm upon me, and in this awful guise will I remain for the rest of my natural life. At first none of the huge creatures spoke to him. For some reason or other they seemed to be very sad and moved gently about the hall, talking quietly and mournfully to one another, or lay sadly upon the sandy floor wiping big tears from their eyes with their soft, furry fins. But presently they began to notice him and to whisper to one another, and presently his guide moved away from him and disappeared through a door at the end of the hall. When he returned, he held a huge knife in his hand. "'Didst thou ever see this before?' he asked, holding it out to the unfortunate seal-catcher, who, to his horror, recognized his own hunting-knife with which he had struck the seal in the morning, and which had been carried off by the wounded animal. At the sight of it he fell upon his face and begged for mercy, for he at once came to the conclusion that the inhabitants of the cavern, enraged at the harm which had been wrought upon their comrade,
had, in some magic way, contrived to capture him and to bring him down to their subterranean abode in order to wreak their vengeance upon him by killing him. But instead of doing so, they crowded round him, rubbing their soft noses against his fur to show their sympathy, and implored him not to put himself about, for no harm would befall him, and they would love him all their lives long if he would only do what they asked him. "'Tell me what it is,' said the seal-catcher, "'and I will do it if it lies within my power.' "'Follow me,' answered his guide, "'and he led the way to the door "'through which he had disappeared "'when he went to seek the knife. "'The seal-catcher followed him, "'and there in a smaller room "'he found a great brown seal "'lying on a bed of pale pink seaweed "'with a gaping wound in his side. "'This is my father,' said his guide, "'whom thou wounded this morning.' thinking that he was just one of the common seals who live in the sea, instead of a merman who hath speech and understanding as you mortals have. I brought thee hither to bind up his wounds, for no other hand than thine can heal him. I have no skill in the art of healing, said the seal-catcher, astonished at the forbearance of these strange creatures, whom he had so unwittingly wronged, but I will bind up the wound to the best of my power, and I am only sorry that it was my hands that caused it. He went over to the bed, and stooping over the wounded merman, washed and dressed the hurt as well as he could, and the touch of his hands appeared to work like magic, for no sooner had he finished than the wound seemed to deaden and die, leaving only the scar, and the old seal sprang up as well as ever. Then there was a great rejoicing throughout the whole palace of the seals, they laughed and they talked and they embraced each other in their own strange way, crowding round their comrade and rubbing their noses against his, as if to show him how delighted they were at his recovery. But all this while the seal-catcher stood alone in a corner, with his mind filled with dark thoughts, for although he now saw that they had no intention of killing him, he did not relish the prospect of spending the rest of his life in the guise of a seal, fathoms deep under the ocean. But presently, to his great joy, his guide approached him and said, Now you are at liberty to return home to your wife and children. I will take you to them, but only on one condition. And what is that? asked the seal-catcher, eagerly overjoyed at the prospect of being restored safely to the upper world and to his family, that you will take a solemn oath never to wound a seal again. "'That will I do right gladly,' he replied, for although the promise meant giving up his means of livelihood, he felt that if only he regained his proper shape, he could always turn his hand to something else. So he took the required oath with all due solemnity, holding up his fin as he swore, and all the other seals crowded round him as witnesses, and a sigh of relief went through the halls when the words were spoken for he was the most noted seal-catcher in the north. Then he bade the strange company farewell, and accompanied by his guide, passed once more through the outer doors of coral, and up and up and up, through the shadowy green water, until it began to grow lighter and lighter, and at last they emerged into the sunshine of earth. Then, with one spring, they reached the top of the cliff, where the great black horse was waiting for them, quietly nibbling the green turf. When they left the water, their strange disguise dropped from them, and they were now as they had been before, a plain seal-catcher and a tall, well-dressed gentleman in riding clothes. "'Get up behind me,' said the latter, as he swung himself into his saddle. The seal-catcher did as he was bid, taking tight hold of his companion's coat, for he remembered how nearly he had fallen off on his previous journey." Then it all happened as it happened before. The bridle was shaken and the horse galloped off, and it was not long before the seal-catcher found himself standing in safety before his own garden gate. He held out his hand to say good-bye, but as he did so the stranger pulled out a huge bag of gold and placed it in it. "'Thou hast done thy part of the bargain. We must do ours,' he said. "'Men shall never say that we took away an honest man's work without making reparation for it, and here is what will keep thee in comfort 
to thy life's end. Then he vanished, and when the astonished seal-catcher carried the bag into his cottage and turned the gold out on the table, he found that what the stranger had said was true, and that he would be a rich man for the remainder of his days. THE PAGE BOY AND THE SILVER GOBLET There was once a little page boy who was in service in a stately castle. He was a very good-natured little fellow, and did his duty so willingly and well that everybody liked him, from the great earl whom he served every day on bended knee, to the fat old butler whose errands he ran. Now the castle stood on the edge of a cliff overlooking the sea, and although the walls at that side were very thick, in them there was a little postern door which opened onto a narrow flight of steps that led down the face of the cliff to the seashore, so that any one who liked could go down there in the pleasant summer mornings and bathe in the shimmering sea. On the other side of the castle were gardens and pleasure grounds, opening on to a long stretch of heather-covered moorland, which at last met a distant range of hills. The little page boy was very fond of going out on this moor when his work was done, for then he could run about as much as he liked, chasing bumblebees and catching butterflies, and looking for birds' nests when it was nesting time. And the old butler was very pleased that he should do so, for he knew that it was good for a healthy little lad to have plenty of fun in the open air. But before the boy went out, the old man always gave him one warning. Now mind my words, laddie, and keep far away from the fairy no, for the little folk are not to trust to. The no of which he spoke was a little green hillock, which stood on the moor not twenty yards from the garden gate, and folk said that it was the abode of fairies, who would punish any rash mortal who came too near them. And because of this the country people would walk a good half mile out of their way, even in broad daylight, rather than run the risk of going too near the fairy no, and bringing down the little folk's displeasure upon them. And at night they would hardly cross the moor at all, for everyone knows that fairies come abroad in the darkness, and the door of their dwelling stands open, so that any luckless mortal who does not take care may find himself inside. Now the little page boy was an adventurous white, and instead of being frightened of the fairies, he was very anxious to see them and to visit their abode, just to find out what it was like. So one night, when everyone else was asleep, he crept out of the castle by the little postern door and stole down the stone steps and along the seashore and up on to the moor and went straight to the fairy No. To his delight, he found that what everyone said was true, the top of the no was tipped up, and from the opening that was thus made, rays of light came streaming out. His heart was beating fast with excitement, but gathering his courage, he stooped down and slipped inside the no. He found himself in a large room lit by numberless tiny candles, and there, seated round a polished table, were scores of the tiny folk, fairies and elves and gnomes, dressed in green and yellow and pink, blue and lilac and scarlet, in all the colors, in fact, that you can think of. He stood in a dark corner watching the busy scene in wonder, thinking how strange it was that there should be such a number of these tiny beings living their own lives all unknown to men at such a little distance from them, when suddenly someone, he could not tell who it was, gave an order. "'Fitch the cook!' cried the owner of the unknown voice, and instantly two little fairy pages, dressed all in scarlet livery, darted from the table to a tiny cupboard in the rock, and returned staggering under the weight of a most beautiful silver cup, richly embossed and lined inside with gold. He placed it in the middle of the table, and amid clapping of hands and shouts of joy, all the fairies began to drink out of it in turn." and the page could see from where he stood that no one poured wine into it, and yet it was always full, and that the wine that was in it was not always the same kind, but that each fairy, when he grasped its stem, wished for the wine that he loved best, and lo, in a moment the cup was full of it. 
"'Twould be a fine thing if I could take the cup home with me,' thought the page. "'No one will believe that I have been here, except I have something to show for it.' So he bided his time and watched. Presently the fairies noticed him, and instead of being angry at his boldness in entering their abode as he expected that they would be, they seemed very pleased to see him and invited him to a seat at the table. But by and by they grew rude and insolent and jeered at him for being content to serve mere mortals, telling him that they saw everything that went on at the castle and making fun of the old butler whom the page loved with all his heart. And they laughed at the food he ate, saying that it was only fit for animals. And when any fresh dainty was set on the table by the scarlet-clad pages, they would push the dish across to him, saying, Taste it, for you will not have the chance of tasting such things at the castle. At last he could stand their teasing remarks no longer. Besides, he knew that if he wanted to secure the cup, he must lose no time in doing so. So he suddenly stood up and grasped the stem of it tightly in his hand. "'I'll drink to you all in water,' he cried, and instantly the ruby wine was turned to clear cold water. He raised the cup to his lips, but he did not drink from it. With a sudden jerk he threw the water over the candles, and instantly the room was in darkness. Then, clasping the precious cup tightly in his arms, he sprang to the opening of the knoe, through which he could see the stars glimmering clearly. He was just in time, for it fell to with a crash behind him, and soon he was speeding along the wet, dew-spangled moor with the whole troop of fairies at his heels. They were wild with rage, and from the shrill shouts of fury which they uttered, the page knew well that if they overtook him, he need expect no mercy at their hands. And his heart began to sink, for, fleet of foot though he was, he was no match for the fairy folk, who gained on him steadily. All seemed lost, when a mysterious voice sounded out of the darkness. If thou wouldst gain the castle door, keep to the black stones on the shore. It was the voice of some poor mortal who, for some reason or other, had been taken prisoner by the fairies, who were really very malicious little folk and who did not want a like fate to befall the adventurous page-boy. But the little fellow did not know this. He had once heard that if anyone walked on the wet sands, where the waves had come over them, the fairies could not touch him, and this mysterious sentence brought the saying into his mind. So he turned and dashed, panting, down to the shore. His feet sank in the dry sand, his breath came in little gasps, and he felt as if he must give up the struggle, but he persevered, and at last, just as the foremost fairies were about to lay hands on him, he jumped across the watermark, onto the firm wet sand, from which the waves had just receded, and then he knew that he was safe. For the little folk could go no step further, but stood on the dry sand, uttering cries of rage and disappointment, while the triumphant page-boy ran safely along the shore, his precious cup in his arms, and climbed lightly up the steps in the rock and disappeared through the postern. And for many years after, long after the little page-boy had grown up and become a stately butler who trained other little page-boys to follow in his footsteps, the beautiful cup remained in the castle as a witness of his adventure. <laughs>